Hello and welcome to a revision session looking at the impact of war on Britain. In particular, uh, what impact did the world wars have on social divisions? So that means sort of like class systems and things like that. Did it reduce social divisions between the upper and middle and lower classes? Um, or uh, did it increase them? Or perhaps it didn't affect them at all? So before World War I, uh, there was a war called the Boer War, which was fought in South Africa. And it did start to have an effect on the people in the working classes. Uh, one of the ways that it had an effect on them um, was that the Boer War in South Africa, we found around about 40% of the population who attempted to sign up to help fight in that war were actually not fit enough uh, to be able to be signed up as, as troops. And that really worried the government and it led to them wanting to start to make changes, um, which they hadn't really done on such a scale before. Uh, to helping people with hygiene, preparation of food and the practice of household cleanliness uh, and feeding young children. All of these things were highlighted by a report which was created after the end of the Boer War. Uh, if you want the posh name, it's the report of the Interdependal, uh, Interdepartmental Committee on Physical Deterioration um, and it expressed a need for um, sort of nutritional reform at a family level and they said that the reason that 40% of troops weren't fit enough to sign up for the army which was a worry for the government if you want to win wars was because um, effectively it's it's poverty and um, that they didn't have enough money for those things like um, having enough food um, and they didn't necessarily have enough money to feed their children um, or in terms of household cleanliness it could be to do with uh, the overcrowded uh, working and living conditions that they were uh, experiencing. Much of the report focused on the health problems of children um, and it, it considered them to be malnourished. As a result of the report, therefore, free school meals were offered uh, to less affluent uh, children and uh, routine examinations of school children's health began in 1907. Um, it wasn't just a charitable thing, it was largely, like we've mentioned, because... Um, the army had said they were really worried that they weren't going to be able to recruit enough physically adequate men, as the report put it. Um, so either by the wrong way, this Boer War did trigger a, a start and a change for um, welfare being put in place for those who were less well off. So if we have a look, we've got examples of new laws that the Boer War triggered. So in 1902, um, there were laws passed about midwives. So midwives had to be properly trained and registered. They couldn't just be any old person um, who had experienced lots of births before. They needed to have proper training. And that helped to massively reduce the infant mortality rate, so the number of babies dying um, during childbirth. In 1906, we see the Free School Meal Act, which meant that all poor children... Uh, were given meals at school during the day and that meant that they would have at least one meal a day which would hopefully help make them stronger and healthier. Uh, we see in 1907 schools providing free medical checks and um, school nurses and doctors as well for the students whilst they were there. So these were all major steps forward in terms of access to health care and food for the children of the working classes in particular who wouldn't have been able to necessarily afford a, a private doctor um, or necessarily three or three hot meals a day. So in 1907, we also see all births being legally required to be notified to a local health visitor. Um, so this meant that the council would know who they needed to provide care to. Um, in 1908, the Old Age Pensions Act uh, was also created. This, for the first time, meant that old people... Um, were, were helped out and, and instead of being left to live in poverty if they didn't have enough money to get them by um, if they weren't able to carry on working uh, they would now be supported 1909 Town Planning Act banned any more back-to-back -back housing so it's trying to improve living conditions of the poor uh, the, although it didn't necessarily knock down existing housing um, in 1911 the National Health Insurance Act meant that men who were in work uh, were entered into a, a scheme um, where money was uh, sort of taken in a small tax whilst they were working and the money could be drawn out that they'd saved away uh, if they were ever sick so that they could go and see a doctor. Uh, 
So all of these things are providing um, greater benefits for those people in the working classes than they'd ever seen before being offered by the government. In World War I, we see some more changes which might um, help to reduce social divisions between classes, um, and that in particular included rationing. One of the main roles of the government during the World War was, was maintaining supplies of food, and it was essential to prevent Britain being starved out of the war. Uh, so the Germans were surrounding Britain, were an island, uh, and trying to prevent us from bringing food in by sea, by using U-boats, which are like a type of submarine, to sink ships that were trying to come in. Uh, they're also bombing during the Blitz uh, many of the major ports where the ships would come in, which would make it very difficult for Britain to maintain its food supply. So um, one of the key things that the government did was rationing to try and make sure that we could be as self-sufficient as possible in Britain, um, and therefore um, they needed to really tightly control the food that was in the country to make sure everyone got a, a fair amount of that food. So if you're looking at the dates of sources, you'd expect to see sources about rationing in World War I after around 1917. Um, in 1917 is when the Germans were using submarines, the U-boats that we just talked about, to stop uh, supplies reaching Britain. This was so successful that Britain had only about six weeks worth of food left. So this was a major crisis point uh, for Britain, only six weeks worth of food once the Germans started using their submarines. That's a really short amount of time, about a month and a half's worth of food. Uh, so as a result of that, there's a, this real fear and panic about the food that's left. Um, and prices of food sharply increased because anyone selling food realised that they could make a lot of money out of it because it was in high demand. Everyone knew there was only six weeks worth of food left. Uh, everyone wanted to get their hands on it. And queues to buy food grew hugely. Uh, coal was also in short supply and was rationed in October 1917 as well. Um, that was something else that they were trying to import. Um, and the government was reluctant to bring in compulsory rationing and initially asked people to ration themselves. So please just be careful, only eat as much as you, you need, try and save things. Um, but voluntary rationing didn't work. Queues got a lot longer. The rich seemed to have more access to food because they could buy it on the black market uh, so that means sort of illegally they could buy a lot more food than they necessarily needed. They could afford to pay huge prices for food uh, to someone and, um, and, and lots of people might be happy for them to pay huge prices for things and just not tell or report on the rich. So in that way, voluntary rationing definitely didn't decrease social divisions. In fact, it may have increased social divisions as the rich would have access to lots of food on the black market where the, the poor wouldn't. It caused, it caused widespread resentment. Uh, so by January 1918, the government changed their tack and rationing was introduced as a compulsory thing. Everyone was issued with a ration card and that they had to register with a local butcher and a grocer. Uh, meat and butter was rationed uh, and this system worked because it was seen as very fair. Many poorer people actually got healthier during this period of rationing because they had a fairer share of healthy food uh, and they actually might, in their ration cards, uh, be able to get more food than they would normally, say so more greater portions of meat um, and greater portions of vegetables than they might ordinarily have access to, where perhaps they be, may more frequently be eating sort of bread and things like that uh, previously. Rationing was never as severe as it was in World War II, but we do start to see that change right at the end of the war from January 1918 towards um, rationing. Um, just after World War I, we see the social divisions continuing to uh, change a little. So in 1918, local councils required to provide health visitors uh, and clinics for pregnant women and infants. Councils uh, also set up the day nurseries for children, and that was slightly linked to the mobilisation of women in the war effort just at the end of 1918 there, uh, and trying to get women to work by offering them uh, free nurseries. And in 1919, Subsidiaries for Housing Act set up rules for councils on how they built their houses uh, and provided them on reduced rents for the poor to make sure that everyone had somewhere to live. Um, the government had said it would help sort out housing problems so that um, returning soldiers after World War I would have homes fit for heroes. 
uh, and this act provided a good home for all working class people. So these are legacies of World War I, um, better housing, or marginally better housing that they'd seen before, um, and, and some better healthcare provision uh, as well. So short-term rationing marginally decreased um, the social divisions that there were, and the Housing Act in 1919 also started to decrease um, those social divisions. But in terms of healthcare reforms and things like that, uh, probably a lot of the reforms that happened before World War I had a greater impact on the um, working classes uh, in reducing social divisions uh, than anything else. Okay, so what about in World War II then? Um, what impact did rationing and evacuation have on social divisions uh, in World War II? Um, well, in World War II, rationing was introduced right at the beginning of the war, unlike World War I, where we'd seen it occur right at the very end in the last year of the war. Uh, so in World War II, every person was issued with a ration book. Even the king and queen had a ration book. Uh, that's probably largely for morale purposes. In January 1940, the Minister of Food, Lord Wilton, worked out a fair food ration. So at first, the only things that were actually rationed were sugar and bacon and butter. But eventually all food was actually rationed, uh, except for seasonal fruit and vegetables, uh, which could just be picked off hedgerows and things like that. Uh, that's probably more down to practicality than anything else. Rationing didn't just extend to food, so we also see rationing of anything which is regarded an essential article. So, for example, uh, there's obviously rationing of food, so we see those rationing books, but we'd also see rationing of clothing as well. And that would prevent rich people and the upper classes, or maybe even the middle classes, from buying out everything that was available uh, just in case for them. It meant that there was a fairer access for the, the poorer people and the working classes to um, essentials like clothing. Um, that's not the only thing, or those are not the only things that the government did to try and make sure that everyone had equal access and fair access to things. Uh, so other things they did were things like encouraging people uh, to use their scraps wisely. So there were many uh, schemes where they were saying, you know, all the scraps that we feed do, throw away um, could be equal to X number of loaves of bread. So, you know, keep reusing your scraps of food. Other schemes said things like, you know, feed the pigs. So if you were in the countryside, you could feed the pigs your waste rather than feeding the pigs fresh food. Uh, which you could eat, which would be quite a wasteful thing to do. You could feed the pigs the scraps. Uh, and also schemes like dig for victory. So if you had any spare land, then you could use that to grow vegetables and things like that uh, to feed yourselves and other people. The dig for victory campaign persuaded people to grow as much of their own food as possible, um, and it was against the law to waste food. Uh, the, there were campaigns to give the, the food to the pigs, like we mentioned. Uh, how successful was rationing during World War II? Well, in many ways, it was a success. It was a fair system which ensured that the poor were kept fed and had healthy food. It helped unite people, as uh, whether they were rich or poor, they were sharing alike. The quality of ration clothes was guaranteed by the government's utility mark. And if we consider it as well, um, Britain didn't um, ultimately uh, give in as a result of a lack of food. And in, in, in that way, uh, the country was able to continue fighting and therefore rationing was a success. In other ways, rationing was less of a success. The rich could buy extra rations on the black market. Uh, so it was still possible for people uh, to dishonestly have greater access if they had lots of money to um, food and clothing and things like that. Um, if they were willing to put lots of money up for those things, they could have access to it. Very large families also often ended up better off. So, for example, if you have lots and lots of children, the children might eat slightly less than an adult might. Uh, they might have access to a little bit more food um, or overall as a result of all their ration cards um, than perhaps a person living on their own who would have less likelihood of maybe saving up lots of sugar so that they could make a, um, a treat like a cake or something like that. Uh, food supplies were more plentiful in certain areas. Uh, so, for example, if you lived in the countryside, obviously you'd have access to those seasonal foods, the berries and things like that, uh, much more easily, um, which were used to make things like jams. So you might have access to sweet foods like that. Vegetables were in greater supply in country areas as well. 
Um, so it's all very well having your ration cards, but if you're not able to uh, supplement that with your own things that you're growing, you might struggle more. So you'd expect to see in sources different opinions on how successful rationing was. If you're in the city, where you might be panicking more, you might have less access to those sorts of extra little bits of food. Uh, then if you're in the countryside where vegetables are in great supply, uh, probably easier to access on the black market. Um, and also you'd have access to more seasonal foods as well. Another thing that's quite key in helping to reduce the social divisions in World War II uh, was evacuation. So the Emergency Powers Act, which was a law passed um, in World War II, at the beginning of World War II by the government, giving them extra powers, included uh, the evacuation of mothers and children, uh, children even from towns and cities to the countryside. The government believed that bombing would play a large part in World War II, um, and they thought rather accurately that the Germans would probably target cities and areas where there were big factories and industrial places uh, to try and break the morale of the people and force the people in Britain to try and call on the government to end the war and, and make peace with Germany. Um, as a result of the plans by the Germans to bomb uh, these areas, they, the British government thought the best thing to do would be to move children away from these areas which might be bombed into the countryside where there was much less risk of bombing. Uh, so the first evacuation began on August the 31st, the day before the Germans invaded Poland. Um, and although many parents didn't want to be separated from their children um, or maybe upset by the idea, um, there's no real evidence of panic about the idea of evacuation um, or people refusing to do it. Children were believed to be safer out of the cities and most parents supported the idea uh, initially at the beginning in 1939 that they should send the children into the countryside. Uh, many schools were closed in city areas and teachers were evacuated with the school children uh, so that they could continue to teach their pupils in their new homes and there'd be that sense of continuity uh, for the children that they knew their teachers. When the children reached their destination, they gathered in the village hall. Uh, here, host families chose the children that they wanted. Those children who were left over were taken around the village until a family was forced to take them in. So there were very different experiences for children who were evacuated. Some of them might have felt uh, very lucky. Perhaps they might end up with a family who genuinely wanted to help support children from the cities. Perhaps it might be a family who already had children and really understood how to look after them. Where others, uh, like we see, families were forced to take them in. Um, so they might have a very different experience if the people taking them in were quite reluctant about that idea. The Emergency Powers Act allowed the authorities to force families to take children if they had room in their house for them. So in this way, evacuation might not have been very successful in reducing class divisions, as you might see rich families being forced to take children from poorer families in the cities, um, and it might lead to resentment from those poorer children, perhaps, uh, who felt that it was unfair the way that they're being treated and, and see that class division being reinforced. On the other hand, uh, other children might have gone and be looked after by a richer family or a family with a much larger house than their own back-to-back -back very cramped housing back in the city uh, and felt the re reduction in class division perhaps they felt really looked after and it could have the impact of making wealthy families understand uh, a little more about the hardships of those living in cities and want to do something about it. Uh, for the first six months of the war, there was no fighting, uh, and it was sometimes called the phony war in World War II, um, and because people had expected there to be initial bombing threats straight away, or fighting straight away, um, and as a result, some parents uh, believed that the phony war was something that was going to be all through the war, that actually there was not going to be a threat at all. Uh, so some parents collected their children from the countryside and took them back home. When the Blitz began in September 1940, children had to be evacuated again. So there were two kind of major evacuations, August 1939 and September 1940. It proved much more difficult to evacuate children the second time round. Some children had been mistreated by their first host families, and so they were really reluctant to go back to the countryside because if they and initially when they'd been evacuated if they'd gone to a really reluctant host family and they'd been really mistreated um, and being fed different food perhaps uh, or you know given very little freedom or made fun of by their host families or anything like that then they might be much more reluctant to go back again so 
although in the first evacuation we see very little um, kind of re resistance or reluctance to go and it's a lot more excitement from a lot of the children in the second evacuation in September 1940 uh, we would have we would expect to see sources showing children having very different opinions on evacuation. Um, was it successful? Uh, well in some ways it was. Evacuation saved the lives of many children. Some children stayed with wealthy families and had better standards of living than they had done at home and that reduced their social divisions. Evacuation showed uh, people in the countryside how poor some children in the inner cities were and it made them demand better living conditions in towns after the war. Um, but there were some failures. Evacuees were not used to the life in the country and there were some clashes between them and the locals uh, who believed that the you know the city children didn't have an, any idea how to do things properly um, there's some evidence of housing um, that the housing of evacuees was not always very well organized uh, it could vary from place to place depending on how well um, the the teachers were involved and how well uh, the local sort of officers were involved in making sure the children were okay some children were traumatized by the experience they were taken away from their parents and lived with families who didn't want them uh, and some were very badly treated some were very young when they were sent away and, and that could really impact for them re for the rest of their lives. So let's have a look post-World War II or just during World War II and then post-World World War II um, at something else which also affected uh, social divisions and that was the development of a welfare state which is the government developed a lot further after World War II uh, than it had done initially at the beginning of the 20th century where we st started to see some sorts of things being put in place by the Liberals uh, like the reforms we mentioned earlier, like the Pensions Act, the National Insurance Act, which meant that men had some kind of care um, for sickness benefits, so money paid out so they could afford a doctor in 1911, and there's free school meals and things like that. So let's see how much further that develops uh, during and after World War II, um, and whether that successfully reduces class divisions. So um, in World War One, accelerated process... Uh, leading to votes for women and uh, for men as well. So we saw in 1918 uh, the, the votes changing there uh, for men over 21 and women over 30. During World War II, rationing and evacuation created a genuine desire to produce a new society in which people were protected from the problems of poverty and ill health. And the Labour government in 1945 was elected due to a desire for social change. So... At the end of World War II, a new government, the Labour government, being elected because uh, people wanted change, massive change to uh, living conditions for everyone. Um, so during the World War, something else had happened, and that was the Beveridge Report. Um, this was written by a man called William Beveridge, um, Sir William Beveridge. Uh, in 1941, it was set up by Royal Commission, that means it was set up uh, by the Royal Family, um, and William Beveridge was paid to go round and write a report on how Britain could be rebuilt after the war. So he's trying to consider, okay, well, looking at all the damage, 1941, I think the Blitz has just happened, etc. Um, so he's going round, how can we rebuild Britain after the war? Um, he made recommendations that there were five key things, five giant evils that Britain should try and deal with in order to successfully rebuild after the war. And those were squalor, which was sort of like living in very dirty conditions, ignorance, so lack of understanding, lack of education, want, which is effectively poverty, not having enough of things uh, like food, for example, or housing, idleness. Uh, so that is the idea of laziness, that perhaps unemployment due to choice uh, and disease as well. And the report went on to say that the government should take on responsibility for the people of Britain from the cradle to the grave. So from the moment you're born to the moment you die, the government should take some sort of responsibility. He recommended the setting up of what was known as the welfare state by introduction of the Labour government, 1945 to 51. So the Labour government take on the ideas of these five giant evils and they try and deal with them all um, after this report, the Beveridge Report, uh, which is published in 1942. So the way that they did this, 1945 to 51, um, was trying to um, take, the government took responsibility for helping those who couldn't help themselves. Um, so the attack on want, uh, what they did was um, they gave families an allowance. National insurance was made compulsory and extended to the whole workforce, not just men. 
Um, so that would mean that hopefully uh, women, for example, would be given some sort of support if they were ill. They'd be given money so they could access doctors. Uh, the attack on disease, the National Health Act was created. Uh, that would mean that everyone was going to receive free medical, dental and hospital and eye treatments. Uh, and by 1948, we saw the creation of the NHS, um, which was the National Health Service. And meant, again, everyone would have access to free medical, dental and hospital uh, and eye treatments. The attack on ignorance, uh, the Education Act was passed, which meant that secondary education would be provided for all children. Uh, no one could leave school until the age of 15, and that meant everyone uh, would have greater access to education and therefore greater access to uh, employment opportunities later on in life as well. Uh, and these things all massively decrease class divisions, and they're all triggered by the Beveridge Report, uh, which was about rebuild, rebuilding Britain after World War One. The attack on squalor, council houses were rebuilt um, and uh, to replace bomb damaged homes um, and new towns were built around London to deal with overcrowding. So the government is again decreasing class divisions by making sure everyone has access to homes. In the attack on idleness, by 1950 virtually full employment was achieved. Uh, so unemployment wasn't less of an issue than it might have been before. Money from the USA also provided much needed finance and resources for new buildings. So um, it's not just the government taking action um, using funds and taxes from within the UK, they also rely on uh, funds and, and money from the USA. So did World War II successfully reduce social divisions? Uh, well, like we've mentioned previously, during World War II, rationing and evacuation created a real desire for a new society uh, in which people were protected from problems like poverty and ill health. Uh, the government in 1945 was elected due to a desire for social change. Um, rationing, we've mentioned already, um, was one way that social divisions were decreased. Um, and the rich and poor were given the same, the poor had a balanced diet, many insisted that standards of living should be continued after the war and not just this equality during the war. Evacuation we've mentioned as well meant there was more of a design, desire for an equal society uh, and it drew attention to those in the countryside who perhaps might have lived in better conditions to the de deprivation of the conditions people lived in in the cities that they might have been less aware of before. Uh, and the beverage report, like we've mentioned, also meant people were more aware of uh, the five great evils that needed to be dealt with uh, and the setting up of the welfare state. In terms of the legacy of World War Two, what happened afterwards, uh, Winston Churchill warned that when the Second World War was over, Britain would be left bankrupt. That means without money. Immediately after the conflict, there was a very depressing atmosphere across the country. And there were problems with transport, factories ran out of fuel and at home people had no electricity to cook with. Rationing continued to be enforced right at the end of the war as well, especially with bread uh, because there had been a really bad harvest as well for wheat. Um, so there wasn't that much around and available. So on the 8th of May 1945, when the Second World War ended in Europe, uh, rationing continued. Some aspects of rationing even actually became stricter in the years after the war. Uh, at this time, this was presented as a need to feed the people in European areas under British control, uh, whose economies had been devastated by the fighting, which was partly true, but with many British men still mobilised in the armed forces and austere economic environment and centrally planned economy under the post-war Labour government, uh, resources were not available to expand food production and, and food imports either. So it's partly because the men are still out fighting uh, and not able to come back and help increase the food supply at home uh, through farming and factories, etc. Frequent strikes by some workers, most critically in dock workers, so people working uh, with ships in trading ports, actually made things worse as well. Uh, so because people are striking, that means trade is much more difficult. So right at the end of the war, World War II, we see really, really bad economic and social conditions. Uh, June 1945, the basic petrol ration for civilians was restored. Uh, 19th of July 1945, in order to preserve egalitarian nature of rationing, uh, gift food parcels from overseas weighing more than 2.3 kilograms would be deducted from the recipient's ration. So um, that sort of would slightly reduce 
social divisions because previously if you were rich or you had rich friends you could ask them to send you a food parcel uh, and that wouldn't count as your rations. Uh, Mid-1946, continual rain ruined Britain's wheat crop, bread rationing started. January to March 1947, so this is all after the war, um, in the United Kingdom, long hard frost and deep snow uh, destroyed huge amounts of potatoes, so potato rationing started. Mid-1947, uh, transport and dock strikes affected and uh, caused lots of um, imported meat to rot in the docks, uh, which meant that there was less access to meat, uh, until the army broke the strike. The basic petrol ration was also stopped. Um, on the 1st of June 1948, the Motor Spirit Regulation Act was passed, ordering a red dye to be put in some petrol. That red petrol was only to be used in commercial vehicles, uh, so that's things like perhaps tractors and things that might be doing a really important factory job. A private car driver could lose his driving licence for a year if red petrol was found in his car. The petrol station could be shut down if it sold red petrol to a private car driver. Um, in 1948, in June, we see the basic petrol ration being restored. As result, uh, It was a third of its previous size. 1948, bread came off the ration finally. So that's three years after the end of World War II. So rationing continues for that period. So in that way, you could argue perhaps, although there's austerity, people have less access to things than they'd hoped for and would have felt quite disillusioned at the end of the war because they were hoping for increased living and working conditions. Um, actually, it would have continued that um, de decrease in social divisions because everyone would have access to the same sorts of things. May 1949, clothes rationing ended, uh, so that's four years after the end of the war. According to one author, because attempts to enforce it defeated, uh, were defeated by continual massive illegality, so the black market, unofficial trade in loose clothing coupons, uh, forged clothing coupons, bulk thefts of unissued clothes, uh, ration books. Um, and on the 23rd of February 1950, the general election is fought largely on the issue of rationing, uh, the Conservative Party campaigned on the manifesto and ending the rationing as quickly as it could. Uh, so all of those things led to uh, an end to rationing. So even at the end of World War II, uh, we see uh, the continuation of rationing. We see the development of the welfare state. Um, so I would say short term, things that had the biggest impact on reducing social divisions were probably rationing. Uh, evacuation being second, and that varied quite a lot uh, depending on the area and families that you would come across. But it definitely increased awareness of the need to decrease social divisions. Um, and then longer term, the development of the welfare state due to the beverage report and the ideas about how to rebuild Britain um, had a longer term impact in re reducing those social divisions. Uh, good luck with your revision. <laughs>